I have Trying to find a cure room. I have the flash disk if we need to reload them again. We are ahead of schedule, so it's okay if we go over a little few okay. minutes. Okay. Let me see. Are you putting on the new uh, slide? No. Okay, that one. <laughs> That's one. But we are now uh, want to hear the 509 slides. The title is Characteris Characterizing the this Female This just builds Eurothron, suspense for the yeah, okay. urethral ah, talk. It's it really is. wonderful. <laughs> So I'm presenting work uh, on behalf of um, the colleagues in my research group and our research group who work at Loyola University and with whom I still collaborate, um, Bailey Hostetter, who is in the laboratory. She's a PhD candidate student. And um, Brendan Chen, who is a, one of our urogynecology fellows. Beth Miller, a urogynecologist and urologist. And Alan Wolf, my longtime collaborator, who's a microbial geneticist. Uh, I've, in addition to the um, disclosures we've shown before, I'll uh, show these again, same disclosures. And in this study, based on the findings that we had in our prior study, we began to get curious about looking at the urethra. Knowing that there was a difference between the voided specimens and the catheterized specimens, was there a question of microbial reservoir in the urethra? And in this study, we attempted to characterize the urethral microbiota and to cut to the chase, yes, there is a urethral microbiota. And in this study, we decided to characterize the frequency and the abundance of the, urethral, of the urethral species, characterize the urethral microbiota of the lower urinary tract and the vulvovaginal skin, which contributes to the midstream voided samples, and compare the microbiota of the voided samples to identify the niche reported on. So when you get a midstream urine, you're getting urethra, vulvovaginal skin, bladder, and we're trying to figure out a way to be able to use voided samples for large population scale studies of the microbiota. In this study, we had 50 participants who contributed four samples in the following order. The standard midstream voided urine, which I think is the majority of clinical specimen collection. We also collected a periurethral swab, about five millimeters from the urinary opening. The urethral brush, participants love this part, just kidding. <laughs> but it made it seem the urethral catheter so much easier, so by the time we got to that, that was pretty straightforward. These samples were all cultured with the expanded quantitative urine culture, which we know simulates the uh, culture-independent methods, uh, such as sequencing with 16S rRNA. Bacterial isolates were again identified with Maldi-Toff mass spectrometry. Um, the fifth, the, actually, 49 patients, ultimately, we had final data on. The median age was 55, with a range of 21 to 85. Most were postmenopausal, slightly more than half were sexually active, and most were Caucasian. So here I'm going to show results from a Bray-Curtis dissimilarity index. And let me orient you to this slide. In the Bray Curtis dissimilarity index, one means very dissimilar, and zero means very similar. And here we're comparing B bladder with, with the urethral specimens. And so you can see the distribution of the results here. And overall, the bladder and the urethra results were very dissimilar, suggesting that these are two separate uh, microbial niches. This is the data for the other comparisons, bladder and periurethral, again, very dissimilar. Bladder and voided specimen, very dissimilar. And then urethra to periurethral, somewhat more similar. Urethra to voided, not as dissimilar. And periurethral to voided. Neither of these are exactly similar. And so it suggests that these are distinct niches, but clearly the bladder and the voided urine are very distinct niches. And it raises the question about, should we even be using midstream voided urines? We had some evidence of what we call specialists versus generalists within the lower urinary tract, which microbes are uh, able to reside in both niches. And again, I will draw your attention to this group here, the A group, Actinomyces, Aerococcus, and Alliscardovia. These are actually found uh, fairly regularly in bladder specimens and very rarely 
if ever, cultured in the standard urine culture. Uh, and actinomyces especially is known as an emerging pathogen, and with standard culture, without um, any identification, you will not be able to clinically resolve symptoms in patients who have this. You can see the lactobacillus population is relatively similar in all four uh, specimens. And other non-contributors that aren't in the top 10 are much more common in the voided specimen. Um, in English, we have a word for this. We call it schmutz. And so you don't exactly know what you're getting, and it can make it difficult to interpret. This is just the abundance of the um, top 10 most prevalent genera here in the bladder, urethra, periurethra, and voided. And more important than the specific microbes, you can just see that the distributions are different the blue being lactobacillus. And there is a distinct lactobacillus that lives in the bladder that is not a contaminant from the vagina. So we conclude that the bladder and the urethra are each distinct niches within the lower urinary tract. The urethral microbiota represent, re resembles the periurethral microbiota, and the midstream voided urine resembles the periurethral skin. Some microbiota prefer to reside in the bladder, like uh, e. coli. Others prefer to reside in the urethra or periurethra, like Carinibacterium, and some are found in similar levels regardless of those two niches, such as Lactobacillus and Gardnerella. So techniques that we might use to bioinformatically, analytically subtract urethra or a periurethral swab from a voided specimen will not likely give us the true picture of the bladder. Uh, and this is unfortunate because we were hoping that if we could get a voided sample and a periurethral swab, we could infer the presence of uh, the microbes in the bladder, but this looks like we won't be able to do that. Midstream voided urine often reports on vulvovaginal skin flora. This may be misleading for diagnostic purposes, especially when perineal hygiene is lacking. For perineal microbiota studies, we believe still that catheterized urine should be used, and this is limiting because this also may change what exactly we're trying to measure in long-term studies. So this remains a challenge in microbiota research. However, we feel strongly that the, micro, the midstream urine samples should be described as genitourinary microbiota and not lower urinary tract or bladder microbiota. And we hope that cleaner catch measure. Uh, methods should be developed and used uh, when catheterization is not possible or feasible. Thank you. I look forward to the question and discussions on these papers. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the floor? We're running a little bit late, but I'm, I just have a, one question. How do you, what do you suggest we do then? <laughs> We're working on it, Mike, I tell you. Um, there are better techniques. Um, there's a UK device that I don't own anything or have any sponsorship related to this called a PZ. Some of you may know this device. It looks sort of like a flower watering can, and it uh, at least takes off the first portion to get you a better midstream urine. And um, it's, it's better. It's still not quite good enough, but it's at least a move in the right direction as opposed to having a patient try to hit a little cup in a bathroom, which doesn't work very well. So I just had a quick question. Uh, yes. C.R. Powell from Indiana mm -hmm. University. Yeah, um, the, so your original work um, was using suprapubic aspirates in anesthetized women, if I remember correctly. Would you envision a time when that might become more the standard than using the urethra or, of course, midstream voided urine? A great question. We did the suprapubic aspirates just to validate that this was not a contamination. And we did the sure. suprapubic aspirate with a control for the needle passage through the skin. I, I definitely don't think we'll need to do suprapubic aspirates long term. Okay. Um, and I, I don't think that that's going to be important. However, knowing that we have very high rates of perioperative UTI and the patient is already there anesthetized and we don't routinely test urine cultures, and people with positive urine cultures preoperatively mm -hmm. are at a significantly increased risk for postoperative UTI. It is something to consider in that setting. Mm -hmm. Thanks. No, just a, a question, sort of a comment. Really nice work, as, as, as always. So I appreciate your, your comment about not labeling this necessarily the bladder, because there's a lot of interest, as you know, in terms of the gut microbiota and affecting chronic kidney disease. So I, I would imagine this is going to be a little bit difficult to, to parse out 
over time. But yeah. doing your work on, on urethra is, is really interesting. Yeah, and we don't really have, Lori, thank you for that insightful comment. We don't really have enough information yet about how these microbial neighborhoods talk to each other. How do they know one is changing? Um, we just make assumptions that a healthier gut is going to lead to a healthier bladder, but that hasn't really been studied yet. So thank you for your insights. Thank you all. Okay, thank you very much.